Let's go ahead and talk about pseudoclasses and pseudoelements. Now I've already introduced you to pseudoclasses. We worked with the hover, active, visited, and link state on anchor elements. There are a whole slew of additional pseudoclasses as well as pseudoelements. So let's look at some of these. A CSS pseudoclass is a keyword added to a selector that specifies a special state of the selected elements. An example would be the hover state on a link. A CSS pseudo element is a keyword added to a selector that lets you style a specific part of the selected element. An example of this would be first line. This can be used to change the font on the first line of a paragraph. Let's look at some of the pseudo classes. Pseudo classes select regular elements, but under a certain condition like when they're positioned relative to siblings or when they're under a particular state. Here's a list of pseudoclasses in CSS3. As I mentioned, we already talked about the dynamic pseudoclasses for the most part. These are the ones that we would commonly use on links. We also have UI element state pseudoclasses. These are things like enabled, disabled, and checked. They're usually used with forms. Then we have structural pseudoclasses. There are a lot of these. They are first child, last child, nth child, nth of type, only child, only of type, root, and empty. And then we have other pseudoclasses, which are not target and language. We're going to look at a couple of these so you can better understand how they work on an actual web page. Here's the starting code that we're going to be working with. I have an article with a class of example one. It contains a main heading, five paragraphs, a subheading followed by two paragraphs. Let's go into our style.css file. And I already have some basic styles that are just formatting some of the basic properties on my elements. What we'll do to start off with is we're gonna target example one paragraph. And I'm going to use the nth child pseudo class in the parentheses I'll pass in odd this is going to pick every odd paragraph from the criteria that we specified and what we'll do here is we'll change the color of the paragraph if I save my page and we refresh you can see what happens every odd paragraph is going to turn to be this brick red now you may be wondering why the second and the fourth paragraphs are turning red. The reason why is because when we use our nth child, it is not type specific. So it's looking at all of the children of the parent element, which is the article of example one. The first element that we see is our heading. This is an odd element. The first paragraph becomes an even element. Then we have odd, even, odd, even, odd even odd so you can see the ones that are odd are going to change and become the brick red color even though some of our other items are odd the main heading and the subheading they do not turn to be the brick red and that's because we specifically said paragraphs that are odd need to turn to be the brick red Let's go ahead and contrast this with the nth of type selector. I'm going to simply copy this and we'll just comment this rule out for now. I'm going to change the selector to be nth of type and let's just change the color here as well. Now when I save the page and we refresh in the browser, you're going to see that the page looks a little bit differently. Now, all of the paragraphs that we would deem as being odd are going to change to being the teal green. So here's our first paragraph. That's paragraph one, two, three, four, five. And now we jump down to six and here's seven. Now our criteria has been changed and it's only looking for the paragraphs that take into consideration. When we use nth child, it's looking at all of the children of the parent element, which is the example one article. In this particular scenario, we may not get what we would normally deem as the odd paragraphs. 
But if you really look at what's happening, you can understand why the CSS is rendering in this way. I'm going to go back into my HTML and I am going to uncomment out part of the second article. So to begin with, I have an article with a class of example two. It contains a headline, an image, and then an unordered list. If we save our page and we render, this is what my page currently looks like. I'll go into the CSS file, and this time we're going to use example two. I'm going to start off with li first child. Once again, we'll go ahead and set a color value. When I save the page and refresh, you can see that the first list item has now changed to this teal color. We're specifying li first child. It's going to get the first child that is a list item. We can get more sophisticated with our selectors using the pseudo classes. This time I'm going to use li and we're going to use nth child, but I'm going to put in parentheses and pass in a numeric value. For this one, we'll just change the font weight to be bold. If I save and we refresh, you can see that the fourth list item now becomes bold. When we use nth child and we pass in a numeric value, we can target that specific element. There are lots of ways that you can use these pseudo class selectors. I'm going to use my nth child one more time, but this time in the parentheses, I'm going to pass in 2n. And we'll just set the font style to be italic, and we'll also pass in a color. If I save my page and we refresh in the browser, you'll see that every second item turns blue and italic. When we use the 2n, it's counting by twos. There are many creative ways in which you can use the pseudo classes. This just gives you a little taste about how we can incorporate selecting specific items on our page. Before we wrap up, let's go ahead and let's look at the pseudo elements. Pseudo elements effectively create new elements that are not specified in the markup of the document and can be manipulated much like a regular element. This introduces huge benefits for creating really cool effects with minimal markup. It also aids significantly in keeping the presentation of the document out of the HTML and in the CSS where we know it belongs. With the introduction of CSS3, the difference between pseudo classes and pseudo elements is a lot more clear, as it's now the standard to use a double colon on pseudo elements. However, if you do end up using a single colon, all of the browsers will still understand and they will render it correctly. But if you want to be a little bit more consistent with your code, I suggest you use the double colons on pseudo elements. Using the double colons will distinguish the pseudo elements from pseudo classes, but browsers support both syntaxes for the original pseudo elements. What I'll do is I'll go back into my index page and I'm going to uncomment out this paragraph right here. This paragraph is going to appear underneath the unordered list. These are block level elements. They're simply going to stack on top of each other. We'll go into our CSS and I'm going to make a rule for example two. I'm going to target my image and we're going to tell it to float left. Now, as you would expect, the image is going to appear on the left and the subsequent content is going to be pulled over and fill in the available space along the right. Because list items are out dented, they're not inside the list. They will actually appear on top of the image. In order to fix this, what I'm going to do is I'm going to use a group selector and we're going to target the unordered list item and tell it to float left as well. When I refresh, you can see that now the image and the list appear as we want to. Now, of course, our paragraph is going to fill in this available space. What I'd really like to do here is I would like the image and the list to appear as we see it here, but I want the paragraph to appear underneath. Now we talked about how we can use the clear, but what I want to show you here is a really nifty trick where you can use a pseudo element. As I mentioned, we want to put a clear 
and clear this float behavior. If we look in our HTML, we know that the image is floated left. We also know that the UL is floated left. So normally I would need to insert a clear right here in between the UL and the H3. But instead of adding additional HTML markup, I'm going to go into my CSS styles and we're going to use a pseudo element. My selector is going to be example two, H3 colon colon B4. This pseudo element will actually create HTML that is not part of my page and it's going to occur before our H3. In order to have this work correctly, I'm going to add the content property and I'm just going to set that to nothing. I need to set some content in here so that the clear behavior will attach to something. In addition to adding the content property, I also need to use display block. Finally, I will go ahead and specify a clear and I'm just going to clear both. If we save the page and we refresh, you can see that now the paragraph appears below these items. And if I open up my developer tools and we look down here in our HTML, you can see that inside my H3 tag, I have this before pseudo class. The pseudo class is what's allowing the clear to function. If I turn this off, you can see how the paragraph is going to now appear to the right. But as long as this is here, the clear is now occurring. This method is the preferred method of clearing floats because you don't have to add any additional HTML. This will be more concise and it separates the presentation from the rest of the content. I have one more thing that I want to show you in regards to pseudo elements. I'm going to go back to my index page and I'm going to uncomment out my very last section on this page. As you can see, I have a header, an image, followed by a paragraph. Now what we're going to do is in our CSS, we're going to go ahead and we're going to float the image on the right. Then I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to use my example three P colon colon first letter. What we're going to do here is we're going to create a drop cap on the very first letter of our paragraph. So what I'll do here is I'll specify a font size and I'm going to set the font size to 600% to make it considerably larger. I'm going to specify a font weight and make it bold. I'll use font style and make it italic. And I'm going to set my line height 2.6. Finally, I'm going to use a float left. If I save now and we refresh, you can see that my image moves to the right. That's because it's being floated on the right. And I have this really nice drop cap that we would normally find in print. Using the pseudo element of first letter allows us to target the very first letter of our paragraph. I know that the difference between pseudo classes and pseudo elements can be a little confusing. Basically, a pseudo class is a selector that assists in the selection of something that cannot be expressed by a simple selector. For example, hovering. A pseudo element, however, allows us to create items that do not normally exist in the document. We just saw how we could do this with first letter and before. If you have difficulty remembering the difference, just think of what the names pseudo element and pseudo class are actually implying. A pseudo element is a fake element. It isn't really in the document with the real ones. Pseudo classes are like fake classes that are applied to elements under certain conditions. I encourage you to start working with the pseudo classes and pseudo elements when you have a chance so that you'll become more familiar and be able to incorporate them into your web pages.